give the meeting a proper introduction. Um, sure. And first of all, you know, we can't, must not see what's happening in Myanmar in isolation, either geographically or historically. And if you think back to the Arab Spring, and that touched off a whole wave of struggle around the world. And basically the Arab Spring was at least temporarily defeated and that set off a wave of reaction, including the election of Trump here in the United States. And now it seems like a new wave of struggle is developing and it seems that Myanmar is in the forefront of that. So that has, uh, you know, makes what's happening there really important for all of us, not just as a moral or principled question. So we're very happy to have Debbie Stoddard here uh, with us today. She uh, has been in Myanmar, but she presently lives in Thailand. Since 1981, Debbie Stoddard has worked as a crime reporter, government advisor, human rights advocate, and educator. She became an active supporter of the Burma movement in 1988. In 1996, she founded ALSEAN Burma to develop interactive human rights training and ag advocacy programs. She's a member of ESCR Net Corporate Accountability Working Group, SC, and the Innovation for Global Change Govern Governance Circle. She, pre she was previously secretary of FIDH, which is a human rights uh, newsletter. And her focus is on women's leadership, atrocity prevention, and corporate accountability. So we're very happy to have Debbie with her expertise uh, here with us today. And you know what we're hoping and what we're expecting is she'll make a presentation and then people will have, uh, feel free to have, uh, you know, make comments or ask questions and we'll have a free flowing discussion. And then at, you know, um, at the very end, then we'll ask Debbie to give some uh, final words and final sum up. So with that, uh, thank you and uh, Debbie, you know, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, last Saturday, March the 27th was Armed Forces Day. And uh, it marked also the escalation of violence against the pro-democracy movement and ethnic nationality groups. While the deputy defense minister of Russia was the guest of honor at the celebrations in the capital of Naypyidaw, accompanied by representatives from China, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, sorry, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, not Sri Lanka, um, eight countries. While they were having a gala event there, all around the country, the military had unleashed the bloodiest weekend killing over a hundred people. Um, and it's been the, the, the heaviest death toll that we've had in a single day since the military started their coup on February the 1st. I say started the coup because the population of Burma, Burma, Myanmar, has been fighting back to, ref to prevent the military from completing the coup, from securing power over the whole country. We've had protests in 310 out of a total of 330 townships in the whole country. That's 95% of the country. And in many of these places, the protests have been on a daily basis. In the city of Calais, uh, or Calais, it's, it's spelled K-A-L-E or K-A-L-A-Y, in Sagain a region, in the northwest of the country on Sunday, various people were gathered at a barricade on the main street. So they set up this protest barricade and called it the fort. Uh, this 
um, barricade was on the street where we had held a workshop just over a year ago on the intersection between atrocity crimes and violations of economic rights. One of our friends who we've known for many years and who actually um, hosted us to dinner, a uh, home cooked meal um, just over a year ago on one of the nights of the workshop uh, was standing at the barricade and she was shot dead. She was the leader of a, um, a feminist organization called Women for Justice. And when we were having dinner over a year ago, we would, they would talk, she and her colleagues were sharing um, of their struggles in terms of asserting women's rights in a remote part of the country where um, the authorities looked down on women and who put their office under surveillance because they could not handle the fact that there were a group of women doing human rights work. So what we are seeing, um, all, and what we're also seeing is that the uh, military have started using rocket propelled grenades in warfare in the cities. At the same time in Karen state, which has endured about six decades of uh, low intensity conflict the military sent fighter jets to launch airstrikes against civilian communities near the Thai border. They're still bombing them now. The reason is that the Karen, along with other ethnic groups that have armed organizations, have stood against the coup and said, no, we don't accept this coup. We're not going to accept military rule because they understand if this military can do it to the majority Burmans in the cities, then they cannot expect any mercy if this regime secured a hold on power. So now we are facing an all out civil war. The members of parliament who were elected in November last year, were prevented from entering parliament to be sworn in on February the 1st. They were all gathered in Naypyidaw. The military seized power, arrested Aung San Suu Kyi, head of government, and Win President Win Myint, the head of state, declared an illegal state of emergency because under the constitution drafted by the military in 2008, the military, the president is supposed to be the one who declares a state of emergency, but he was under arrest. Um, they confined these members of parliament in a hostel and wouldn't let them leave. But on February the 4th, 378 members of parliament representing 76% of elected members of parliament swore themselves in while under detention. They were later um, sent, some were arrested and others were sent home to house arrest. And they managed to, some people managed to escape from house arrest and then declared themselves on February the 8th as the committee representing the national parliament. Well, um, the, they got busy, they issued laws, they've been meeting online secretly. The military uh, regime has um, declared that they have committed treason, which means it's a crime punishable by death. So if they get caught, they might face a death penalty. But also, the military has warned anyone who talks, interviews, or offers assistance to the CRPH, this interim civilian interim government, um, will be will be sentenced to a maximum of seven years jail because they would be seen to be obstructing the government, i.e., the junta. So um, the 
what has happened is that this CRPH has had to be a partner, had to partner up with the civil disobedience movement and the general strike committees all around the country. And they are now working on forming a national unity government. The timing this week is quite important. The government of Aung San Suu Kyi, who was elected in, 20, in 2015, is officially scheduled to expire on March 31st, and a new government is supposed to come in. And so these elected members of parliament are trying to make a deal so that they can declare themselves the new government in cooperation with ethnic organizations. But what we're starting to see shape up now is the fact that civilians called for UN Security Council intervention. They tried to invoke R2P, the responsibility to protect. Nothing has happened. And so now people are trying to make homemade, homemade weapons to defend themselves and have declared that they will join a new federal army which is going to be led by the ethnic armed organization because this is going to be an out and out war. This is what we're facing if there's no other intervention to prevent this from happening. So um, the state of the movement at the moment is pretty fraught. Some of the um, urban based activists who have been hunted down and can no longer find a place to hide have started to have, have sought asylum and shelter in the ethnic nationality controlled areas. And this is why that these areas are also now a, a higher value target for the military. And that's why they're launching airstrikes on these areas because the military does not want the urban based pro democracy movement to team up with the ethnic armed organizations. So what's the role of the unions and the working class in general? The zones in which the military, the urban zones in which the military has been most cruel and most violent have been working class neighborhoods. Places where, um, neighborhoods where um, Poor people, poor uh, underpaid workers come, come from different parts of the country to get a job in the local factory. Uh, I think it was March 16th, um, in one incident, one of the big issues is that some factories stopped paying full wages or stopped paying the workers completely. So at one factory, when the workers demanded their wages, the manager called the police. And uh, when they arrived, um, the, the, the workers, the leader of the workers, the striking workers was a young woman who tried to say what was going on and the police just slapped her and she slapped the cop back, probably as a reflex. And he immediately took out his gun and shot her dead on the spot. And then they proceeded to kill five other five of her other colleagues and arrested 70 of the workers. This is what happens when you call the cops to try and settle a dispute at this point. So um, the military has um, has been particularly cruel and particularly violent in these working class neighborhoods. And the, the neighborhood in um, Rangoon, where they started using rocket propelled grenades, was in South Dagon, a working class area. Not only did they use rocket propelled grenades, they actually destroyed a local public health center, took all the drugs and medicines, and threw it into the sewer. This is a time when you know, we're suffering from when there's a COVID outbreak and people are trying to wear masks when they are out protesting. So that's the kind of um, stuff that's happening. What was very interesting is that there was this huge split 
between the majority population and the Rohingya. In fact, there was a lot of animosity um, against the Rohingya and a lot of denial of the genocide. But there was actually a group of um, activists, including young, young people and young women who had been doing lone protests very courageously, despite the harassment um, for doing so, they spoke up and stood with the Rohingya and said, we don't accept genocide. If the, you know, we don't accept genocide, it's not acceptable. Well, these are the people who became the, the leaders of the first wave of protests when the coup happened. So um, it actually opened up a lot of eyes. And when people started to realize the impunity with which the military acted, the, some of them then started to say, to openly um, express regret that they had denied the Rohingya and some even publicly apologized in social media to people that they had attacked in the past. And this is a big deal because in Burmese culture, People don't apologize. Apology is seen as a sign of weakness. So um, when we talk about the repression of the Rohingya and other ethnic groups in the, and, and what the coup has done, the coup has united people across many lines. And what was very interesting is that the movement of young people, mainly young people, demanded the abolition of the 2008 constitution, not the amendment, but the abolition, and declared that they wanted a genuine federal union of the uh, union. And, and their demand was put onto the CRPH and the CRPH, the committee representing the national parliament had to embrace those demands. So this is something that's really interesting because it, if it works, if it succeeds, it will be contributing to a creation to the creation of a, a new type of country, a new nation, where um, where Burman dominance and Burman privilege is recognized and is constrained. So um, I've been speaking for about. 15 minutes. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. And, you know, if I'm talking about stuff that's um, new and you want um, to go back to basics and say, where's this place that you're talking about or whatever, just let me know. I'll pull up some maps, etc. cetera. Um, Debbie, but before we do that, one, uh, well, when we get to the discussion, I'm going to turn the chairing over to Cheryl. But one thing that I think is, um, somewhat unique, not exclusive entirely, but somewhat unique in Myanmar is the economic role that the military there plays. And would you speak a little bit about that? And then we'll go on to have a general discussion. Okay, so um, the military took power in a coup in 1962, and we've had successive military regimes. Um, um, and the, the, since 62, the time that, that Burma hasn't been ruled by a military regime has been between 2011 until February this year. Um, now, one of the funny things about Burma is that uh, the dictator Nevin who took over, who, who grabbed a military coup back in 62 was very wise. He actually um, um, had a one party system which was called the Burma Socialist Program Party. So all the lefties did not want to say anything bad about Burma or didn't want to actually analyze what was going on because we essentially had a military regime that had put on a guise of socialism. Uh, 
Um, but actually what had happened was it was a kleptocracy. They basically nationalized everything they could lay their hands on and mismanaged the country into the ground. And we have to understand that at, in the 60s, Burma was considered the most economically advanced country and the country most likely to succeed. Um, I have a, a, a Thai doctor friend who says that when his mother was young, she it was her dream to go study medicine in Burma. So Burma had the most universities, had a high rate of uh, uh, literacy, um, and basically they were the shining light um, in Southeast Asia, and it was a military um, dictatorship that ran it into the ground. But what that meant is that every enterprise was controlled by the military. And later when they, uh, when uh, General Kinyut wanted to open up the country to foreign investment and also get rid of all these non-performing enterprises and sell them off, um, it meant that foreign investors had to um, enter into joint ventures with state-owned enterprises like Myanmar Economic Corporation, Myanmar Economic Holdings, Myanmar Oil and Gas Enterprise. These were all state-owned enterprises. But Myanmar Economic Corporation was an interesting animal because it was one of the few corporations that could had was authorized to sell shares but the only people who could buy those shares were military officers. And that's why you have um, Light Infantry B Division 33 and LID 99, both notorious for the genocidal campaign against the Rohingya, receiving millions of dollars in dividends from Myanmar Economic Corporation because they were essentially monopolies. So when the, when the economy liberalized, some of these corporations were retained um, by the military and these and provide off book um, uh, income for the military. So uh, we, we start to see how the military very quickly got into the business of capitalism um, and transformed state assets into personal wealth. And um, to fund their own agenda. So that this is why one of the first calls um, when the in the past few years when the Rohingya genocide happened was to sanction target sanctions against these military controlled enterprises. So this is something that's happened. But also the other thing that's happened in the past 10 years is that um, some companies have, uh, small and medium enterprises have, have um, emerged. And um, in many cases, if they prove to be um, uh, strong competition against military businesses interests, then they would be snuffed out or bought over or, or muscled out of existence. So we can already start to see um, if they really wanted to have a sustainable economic development, they need, needed to get rid of these enterprises anyway. And the, the military used their military power to essentially grab land and to gain unfair advantage whenever they did business. So that's the, the story of the, the economic, um, the economic uh, situation. And companies like Chevron, Unical, Total, um, they all entered into um, joint ventures with Myanmar Oil and Gas Enterprise. And now they say, oh no, Myanmar Oil and Gas Enterprise, Moji is not that bad. It's not like Mac or Mel. And, um, and um, oh, uh, we can't get out of the deal. Um, and the, it's not that big a deal anyway. And um, uh, electricity in Yangon depends on some of our gas. We supply half the electricity in, in Yangon. So we can't, we, we, we can't stop paying, stop doing business with the military. One of the big things now is that um, 
because General Ming Online is now the head of the junta, basically all government accounts are at his disposal. And the um, civilian interim government has called on oil companies not to pay revenues to these accounts, but rather to put the money into escrow or trust accounts and, and, and only hand them over to the government when civilian rule is restored. And the, the CRPH has also issued a tax moratorium to civilians saying, you don't have to pay tax till September. So don't pay tax because this is not the legal government. Um, so we, we, we starting to see uh, this whole push uh, to deprive the military junta of the means of survival. There's a strong economic um, motivation for this coup. And, um, and actually when the coup happened, what the first thing that the junta tried to do was try to withdraw a billion dollars worth of reserves that um, Myanmar had uh, lodged um, in the US with the, with the, um, with the, don't, do you have a reserve bank here? Yeah. <laughs> with the reserve bank. Um, so um, President Biden was um, basically, it was quite easy for President Biden to freeze that and say, no, you're not getting your, your hands on that money, not for now. So this is, um, uh, so for us, um, we cannot have political transformation without economic transformation. And that's why um, we started an economic literacy program to de demystify macroeconomics in the context of human rights and development. And also have business and human rights training because um, uh, grassroots communities need to um, have the confidence to engage in economic debates, to make economic demands um, if they, to sustain political transformation but also to protect their interests and try and get remedy when their rights are violated by companies. So this is something that's, that um, um, we do a lot of work on. And we also try to uh, look at how economic, progressive economic policies can be, um, can actually help implement transitional and strengthen transitional justice in the country. So these are all things that we're working on even now. While this, um, there's so much uncertainty, people are saying, well, why are you looking at this? Why are you developing um, trainings and discussions on climate change, COVID and conflict when all hell is breaking loose in Burma? And we, we had, yeah, we are responding to all hell is breaking loose in Burma. That is 75% of our time and energy now but we still need to think about the future. And that's where we have to use at least 25% of our resources to focus on the future. Because when all of this, when the dust settles, regardless of who's in power, people need, still need to learn. People still need to defend their rights. People still need to get, get on with the work. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Debbie. So Cheryl is gonna take yeah. over as chairing now. So I see that we've got eight people, including John and Debbie and myself. So that's a pretty small group. <clears throat> I think everybody that wants to speak should be able to say as much as they need to within reason. So uh, the meeting is open. Let's, let's see. Um, Frida's waving her hand. Oh, okay. I don't, you know, Frida, I didn't see your hand. I go, oh, oh, you know what? Okay, let me change my screen. Okay, you were waving. Okay, great. Okay, Frida, go ahead. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Debbie, and thank you, John and Cheryl, for organizing this. This has been a really, really excellent and very illuminating talk. And um, I just have a couple of questions. To start. I have many questions, but two to start with. So one is what kind of 
people to people solidarity has the Myanmar uprising received up to now. Um, secondly is uh, uh, what, uh, what do you see as China's uh, uh, relationship to the uh, military? I mean, we know about it through the news, obviously, but what do you think is the direction of that relationship? Um, and third question is, uh, can you talk more about the role of women in the, in the struggle? Thank you so much. And then if there's time, I'll get to two more questions later, but truly appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Um, shall, I, shall I do that now? Yeah, I would say yes. go ahead. I don't see anybody else raising well, their hand. For thanks this. for the question, Frida. Um, there is a huge amount of people, people solidarity. That's one thing that um, is quite inspiring. Solidarity, not just from non people outside of Burma to people in Burma, but also a stronger sense of solidarity across communities and diverse populations. Um, and um, all of us, um, whether we liked it or not, because, you know, I watched the Hunger Games, so I didn't really, like, when the Thai started using this three-finger salute, I was going like, eh, no. I just want to stick with my fist, but now everybody's doing it. So I had to embrace the three finger salute because it's become a symbol of the, what they call the milk tea alliance. Um, so uh, in Asia, we are a little bit, in this part of Asia, we're a little bit notorious for having really strong, sweet, milky tea. <laughs> and, and people do strange things like put, put jelly bubbles and God knows what else, <laughs> all kinds of stuff in there. Um, so this Milk Tea Alliance, this identity of the Milk Tea Alliance um, has emerged um, between young activists in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in Thailand, and in Burma, but also now everybody's saying we drink milk tea to Malaysia, everybody else is going, getting in on the act. So we, we see this very visible um, um, solidarity utilizing public um, social media. Mm -hmm. and, um, and some of the folks have been actually not without needing to feel coordinated or needing to find a connection, have spontaneously gone to protest in front of the Burmese embassy and even the Chinese embassy. So that's something that's quite um, important. Now, China was a, the big brother of the previous military regime. And um, this was part of their expansionist policy with the Belt and Road Initiative to be able to gain access to the Indian Ocean um, and, and um, the Gulf of Bay of Bengal to, um, um, to kind of offset um, India. And, um, and there were a lot of mega projects that were going on, um, partnerships. Now, ironically, China actually enjoyed a better relationship under the Aung San Suu Kyi government because there was less corruption, things were more predictable, there was greater stability, and the economy was booming. But um, on the ominous side is that um, they were able to secure, a lot of Chinese businesses were able to secure access to natural resources in the ethnic areas. Mm -hmm. And some of the local ethnic communities felt that Aung San Suu Kyi's government had sold them out to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. So this was also something rather different. But China had gotten used to having enjoying um, the benefits of a civilian government when the coup happened. And now they're in, um, they're kind of stuck because the instability means that all their business, economic and strategic interests in Burma uh, are undermined. Um, you can't run your business when the country is in uproar and when the military has basically launched urban warfare against its civilians. 
So this is something where China is now this, you know, if you imagine China as this huge muscle bound giant, not able to be agile enough to, to, to try and find a way to balance out what's going on, they're stuck, have, they're stuck in this default mode of respecting power, no matter how illegal or how bad the power is. But then on the other hand, they're uncomfortable because this means more refugees coming into their area. This means more instability on their front doorstep, um, you know. And um, um, so this is going to be um, a very difficult situation for China. The other, the other fear of China is um, economic sanctions, because even though China doesn't have to impose or follow economic sanctions, the China is so part, so much part of the global economy that um, sanctions may affect their supply chains. You know, so they can't sell their stuff in Walmart if there's if there's something, some component in their product that came from a, a Burmese military company, for example. And China is already feeling a lot of pain because the 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 um, presence of um, Uyghur slave labor in their supply chain has really um, made a huge amount of their products um, banned in the U.S. and U.S. is their biggest market. So um, so that's something to understand. Um, the big big bad wolf in this whole thing is actually Russia. So Russia has been the Burmese military's supermarket for the past 20 years. In 2001, um, they signed up a very sweet deal with Russia and bought a whole bunch of fighter jets, etc. And they've been buying more and more stuff. In fact, they had a significant arms deal one week before the coup. Um, and the Russian Deputy Defense Minister was the guest of honor at last weekend's Armed Forces Day Gala. Mm. Um, and also, um, the in the past 20 years, Russia's actually been giving scholarships to um, Burmese uh, young up-and-coming up and officers um, mm. to study um, nuclear technology, ICT, um, agricultural technology, etc. And so a lot of the fake news um, trolling, the um, surveillance, online surveillance, the control of communications, a lot of the expertise actually came from China, uh, from Russia. And, um, and so the second language, if you went to the Defense Services Academy in Pien Oluen, formerly known as Mamiom, um, they weren't teaching Chinese, they were teaching Russian so that people, young officers could be eligible to go on scholarship. So this is something which is um, something that we need to be aware of. Now, women in Burmese society have this very strange dual role. Uh, under Orthodox Buddhism, women are spiritually inferior. A woman can become a Buddha, but first she has to be reborn as a man. <laughs> so that was supposed to be the chain of uh, spiritual evolution. Um, and then we have um, different ethnic nationalities which have um, some of uh, which, which uh, are Christian. Um, um, so there's Protestant Christians and Catholic Christians and um, animists and Hindus and Muslims. So we have uh, quite a mix. But um, one of the things that happen in, in dominant um, culture in Burma is that whatever a woman wore below the waist was actually spiritually unclean. So um, um, a Buddhist man's spiritual uh, power, also known as the pone, that's why monks are called ponji, 
because they have G is big, so big pawn. So your pawn could be reduced or polluted if, say, a woman sat higher at a higher level above you, or if you, by some um, shock horror accident, uh, touched a woman's footwear or her sarong. So women would actually wash their clothes separate, do they? they? They had, you know, gender segregation in laundry. And also women, the women's um, uh, uh, underwear and sarongs would have to be washed separately and hung on a separate clothesline below the house where no man could accidentally brush up against it. So this was, so, you know, there's this whole thing of shyness and propriety and everyone has to be properly, you know, presented. And, um, but in this case, women started um, using their sarongs against the military. So um, what they did was people in the neighborhood started to put um, clothes lines across the street and hang women's sarongs across the street so that when the military vehicles came they would have to stop and get some junior officer to to pull down the clothes line so that they didn't have to drive beneath women's sarongs <laughs> um, and then women on, on international women's day women started waving sarongs as their flag but then we also saw this really amazing um, protest in Kareni State, which is a very remote part of the country, which is quite conflict ridden. And women stuck sanitary napkins on the posters of the, the head of the junta and even had like, you know, the colored blood. And they, 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 were, they had this slogan that sanitary napkins protect women more than the military. And then they were, they had bras, and they were uh, they had these uh, displaying bras, and said women get more support from bras than from the government, or something like that. So it was really quite funny because you know these taboo, these were all very taboo things, um, and they were you know out there, but also the um, the LGBT community came out strong because this. These um, protests, like March is around the time they have their pride. And so um, there were people, there were, there were uh, uh, people out in drag, you know, walking down these very rocky, <laughs> uneven streets in their high heels, uh, joining, the, um, joining the protest. And so instead of being made fun of and being yelled at or spat at, they were instead welcome. So this is this is the, the inspiring part of it. Um, in the protest, women, uh, at least 50% of the marches, um, women uh, were the majority when it came to the eight o'clock pot, bam, pot banging. And so the military will be saying, it's a curfew, go indoors for your own safety. And all these aunties will be standing on the road banging their pots. So if you actually were having a webinar or a call with anyone in Burma at 8 p.m. their time, that's just a lot of background noise because all the, all everyone's out, all, everyone's out on the street banging their pots in protest. So we see, uh, we see some of that um, happening, that we see women really um, understanding that, th that they have, that it is their country too, and it's their movement too. And in fact, the first waves of protest were led by young women and um, young women uh, workers, because a lot of these garment factories, um, the majority of the workers are women. And so um, a lot of them were out in the street. In fact, two days ago, um, some of the women were protesting and they had a placard in solidarity with the workers at Amazon. Oh, that's funny. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's something that's happening. And traditionally, um, during the civilian government and even before, women were the ones 
who were challenging impunity. They were the ones who were quoting UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security saying, you cannot, uh, you have to hold soldiers accountable for raping and sexual assault of women in the war zones. They were the ones who, women activists were the ones who were, co were considered the spoilers because they kept saying, what about accountability? What about protection of civilians? When people were talking peace talks, most of the peace talks was about business deals, trying to buy off armed groups. But women were in there saying, why are we not allowed in? Where's the transparency? Where's the protection of civilians? Where's accountability for crimes? And so these are the women, including our colleague who was shot dead on Sunday. These were the voices um, trying to hold the military accountable even before the coup. Hope that answers your question. Frida. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Really yeah. All right, Maddie, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, it's really, I know very little about Myanmar, Burma, and it's very enlightening to listen to you. And you have a vast range of knowledge. Um, from the time frame that we got, I'm wondering whether the whole Rohingya persecution wasn't during, didn't start or at least escalate during the civilian rule. That's my first question. My second question is I was listening to the BBC today earlier and they said that there are now a lot, quite a number of refugees that are running not so much, this wasn't about China, the refugees going into China. It was about the refugees going into India. And I've looked at the map, going, getting to India as a mission and Thailand. And they said something about the people in Thailand where the refugees were going actually uh, belong to the same et ethnic group or cultural group and they are forced to take in refugees. What are your comments on these two points, please? Okay, um, the, um, the denial, uh, the, the persecution of the Rohingya had been going on since the 70s and Operation Dragon um, basically resulted in um, many of them being chased into, in, into um, Bangladesh and then um, being the Rohingya being stripped of their citizenship under the 1982 citizenship law. Uh, and then in 2012, um, the first wave of anti-Rohingya violence happened. And this coincided with the first anniversary of the resumption of war in Kachin state. So the military uh, having ruled so brutally for so many years, obviously had to find a way to justify the increase in, in military budget because the military budget has increased by 180% in the past 10 years under civilian rule. And at the same time, um, military attacks on civilian communities rose by 143%. So, um, uh, the military supported the very actively supported the growth of an ultra nationalist Buddhist movement. Um, they tried to rebrand themselves as defenders of the country from um, Muslim fundamentalism. Basically, the whole country would be Taliban be under the Taliban if it wasn't for the military. Um, and many people eventually bought into that, um, that idea. And so it was very easy to continue to persecute the Rohingya. And um, um, I remember in 2012, the first massacre, um, Aung San Suu Kyi actually called Muslim leaders for a meeting at the NLD office 
and called for um, talk spoke about the obligations of a majority to protect the minority that there was a moral obligation and call for calm but um, all of that was uh, is instantly forgotten when um, there when this um, this first massacre was followed by much more brutal violence and then the military then decided to call it a terrorism problem and then Aung San Suu Kyi was put in this position of being accused of supporting terrorism and then there was a whole campaign against the NLD to say that they they um, they put Muslims above national security. And so there's all this other stuff that we didn't see in the public. At the moment on the Indian border, they, um, the, my friend who was killed is in Sagaing, which is, has a border with India. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in fact, uh, some of our uh, acquaint, uh, mutual um, colleagues had already said she should leave for India and uh, she and her colleagues should leave for India and she said we are already under surveillance and we are marked there's no point trying um, so um, but uh, several hundred police who left defected from the junta have fled into India um, they, they said that uh, they they are deserting because they refuse to shoot civilians. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that side of the country. So um, if I've been in that part of India in uh, Mizoram, uh, in Nagaland, Mizoram, that border area, it's mountainous, but people can still get through. On the eastern side, um, it, it's um, Mon State, Karen State, Kareni or Kaya State and Shan State um, borders um, Thailand and part of Shan and Kachin State borders China. On Sunday, the military started airstrikes in Karen State and it's the first time in 20 years. So um, that's why people are fleeing over into Thailand. Now, you know, remember like the, the Kurdish people are kind of um, split up between Turkey and Iraq and you know the um, we have um, ethnic communities with that identity so the there are Thai Karen and Burmese Karen uh, they are Thai Mon and Burmese Mon and up further up they're Thai Shan and Burmese Shan so they might have common um, language common culture um, but in this case, we are facing quite a serious problem in Thailand because several thousand people fled into Thai territory and then now they are being told, they're being forced back. They said, well, you had a couple of days here. Uh, hope you enjoyed the shelter for two days, now you're out. And um, various people videotaped this and reported it to the international media and now Thailand is saying no 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 uh, they're not they no we didn't push them back it's not reform one we 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 they're in another place <laughs> so um so there's a lot of uh, pressure on some of these countries to do something and you know ironically Thailand was at the armed forces day celebration in Napido on Saturday and Basically, by going there and showing their respect at Armed Forces Day was essentially interpreted as a cut lunch. It's like it was like an invitation. Yeah, you can please come and bomb our border. Um, you know, Thai people were really worried because they could see the bombs and the planes flying overhead. Um, so, um, you know, in a way, Thailand was a bit thoughtless in in not thinking through. Um, such things as turning up for um, events like that, the Armed Forces Day celebration in Nikodo, the capital. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, David. I've got John and then um, Michael. And I think uh, let's go ahead and let the two of them speak and then Debbie come okay. back. You're, you're such a powerhouse of knowledge. Okay. Thank you. John. 
I'd like to make a point about the military because um, if you look back, for instance, at the Syrian revolution, in the first years of it, the rank and file soldiers started to desert, went over to the side of the military, uh, of the revolution. And Assad would have been overthrown had it not been for the intervention of Russia and also Iran. And what you have in, in, um, in Myanmar is somewhat unique, but not entirely unique in that as Debbie was explaining and other articles that I'm sure many of us have read explain, you have the military as its own kind of economic institution and extremely segregated from the rest of society. And it seems to me, I've heard uh, Debbie mentioned about some hundreds of police deserting, but not the rank and file soldiers because of that situation. And it's similar actually um, from what I understand in Pakistan and also Venezuela, the military is an economic institution similar to what you have in Myanmar. So the issue is, is not purely confined to, uh, to Myanmar. So I think one thing that we have to think about then is, well, what can we do internationally um, to put pressure on this economic institution? And it uh, seems to me an issue that we have to look into is what are the economic ties of different companies here in the United States with the uh, investments of the military. Because if those investments, as I understand it, if those investments, if the profits of those investments starts to uh, shrink, then that will have an economic impact on the rank and file of the military who at that point, it seems to me, and uh, um, Debbie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me at that point, then their loyalty would start to would start to dissolve. So it would be very interesting. Also, I understand that uh, from just looking at the list here that there's one comrade here who is from or has spent a lot of time in Venezuela where there's a similar situation. And maybe uh, that comrade would have something to, uh, to add to the discussion also. Um, Michael. Yeah, thanks. Um, really appreciate this discussion and all the information. Um, and I, like John, I think I'm kind of coming to this from having tried to support the Arab Spring for the past 10 years. And Myanmar was almost completely off my radar. And I think it's still totally, you know, this is such a powerful movement, but it seems like most people aren't paying attention. Uh, it just kind of come out of nowhere if, if you weren't already uh, involved in the region. And you know, I think it's really important to try to apply all the lessons from that past 10 years of the Arab Spring because there's a lot of worrying parallels to Syria. Um, you know, in particular, we saw there that the, you know, the regime can stay in power even when the economy totally falls apart. Um, and so, you know, hoping that there's things work out differently in Myanmar, but trying to plan ahead if the struggle is protracted of what we can do to support it. So my two questions is first in that regard, you know, I think the Rohingya issue is still unresolved. Um, the CRPH has made some online statements showing sympathy with them, but it hasn't recognized their rights. Um, you know, they made a lot of bold statements on different issues, but it hasn't done that on the Rohingya. Um, from what I can tell, it's that's partially because they're trying to play politics with like the Arakan army, which is anti-Rohingya, to get their military forces on their side. So I just want to know what's going on behind the scenes there to try to get them to do more to support the Rohingya, to make that clear to the world public, because I think that'll be really, really key to 
A, getting solidarity and B, getting ahead of the propaganda offensive, which is already getting started up and it's sure to escalate as Russia gets involved. Mm. My second question is, um, you know, the, the rural movement is so massive. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but cities like Paze, towns like Paze, um, Yeu, just huge crowds, um, very, you know, poor rural people from what I can tell. So, you know, if, if I was a reporter or something in Myanmar, I'd feel like that's where I'd want to go to get the story about what this movement's all about. So if you have, I, I know that there was some talk in the last year or so about market reforms for the land. So, you know, what's going on with the countryside? Um, what, what do we need to know about that part of the movement? Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Debbie. I'm going to come in next. I've got some things to say. Okay. Um, rank and file have um, very often been defecting, and most of them, a lot of them, come to um, uh, even become migrant workers in Thailand. And um, a friend was telling me about her 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 neighbor, who was a migrant worker at a construction site. And um, you know they 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 don't they don't work alone. It's usually a, a group of people from the same neighborhood that travel and work in construction. And um, they had a new worker there. And um, at the dinner at the end of the day, um, one of her, her neighbors said to this new worker, "Where are you from?" And uh, and he was he said this town. He said, "What was your job before you came here?" And uh, um, he said, I, I was a soldier. He says, yeah, I know who you are. You killed my parents. And now I'm going to have to kill you. So um, they, the basically all his friends, his, uh, his community said, we are going to have to move to a new work site because you cannot kill this man. Because if you kill him, then the ties will the we will lose our job and the Thais will prosecute us because they don't understand that this soldier killed your family. So um, very often um, the rank and file, if they don't do the run the business work, do the business errands of their senior officers, they are equally poorly treated and poorly paid. And so sometimes they get to a point where they say, what's the point of us risking our lives? And they surrender. They, they defect or surrender to um, the ethnic groups so that they can get safe passage to Thailand and then become migrant workers and get some money. So I think that's something that, um, but you're, you're right. We need to actually reduce, make the army suffer financially. And that's why we, we need to have targeted sanctions against those companies and their business interests. Um, in 2005, this worked because um, uh, President Bush, believe it or not, actually imposed sanctions um, on financial transactions to Burma, which meant that they, people couldn't um, send money in or out of the country using the banking system. Um, and so that uh, met the formal economy, the military's formal uh, engagement, the formal economy tanked, and they had to purge the Prime Minister Kinyut because he wasn't suffering from the sanctions because he had bought, he was in charge of border trade. So that split the army and created the space for some kind of freedom and some kind of reform. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, um, that's um, um, something that's important. Ironically, when the Arakan army launched its offensive against the military, they actually acknowledged Rohingya as their brothers. So, um, and this is partly because Arakan army's training and weapons came from the Kachin Independence Army. So this is something to be aware of. And, um, Rakhines, after being subjected to similar war crimes and atrocity crimes as the Rohingya 
did earlier, um, started to understand and started to feel some sympathy. So that that's one pic piece of the picture that needs to be addressed. Dr. Sasa, the kind of ambassador at large of the CRPH, the, uh, the interim civilian government, has been actually quite good in talking about no one left behind and referring to the Rohingyas as our brothers and sisters. At the very least, they understand that they need to adopt a rights -based, human rights-based approach in resolving this question. Um, and the um, popular protest movement have clearly said what they want in terms of resolving the Rohingya question. And that means restoration of citizenship and their human rights, um, and also accountability for the crimes. So, so at this point, the interim civilian government needs the protest movement for its to be able to function and for its legitimacy. And so, this is um, the irony is that because of the coup, the internal movements become more democratic. <laughs> So we have that part. And the other unresolved issue is the question of land rights, um, um, addressing um, wave of a wave of land grabs and creating a sense of um, security for especially for agricultural people who need agriculture as their livelihood. Um, so that thing is going to have to be addressed um, in a sustainable and a durable way because there's been, if you, if your land has been grabbed, you have to go to three different committees. It's just ridiculous. Um, and then they brought in this really awful um, uh, land law. So all of that has to be addressed at some point. Um, and did everybody see Simone's post in the chat? Um, I asked him if he would like to say something. So I think he should go next. Should I read it out loud or can anybody read it? Debbie, do you see it. it? I got it. Okay, great. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and address that? Cheryl, would you yeah. read it out loud because we're recording this? So oh, okay. Oh, yes. sure. <clears throat> I am Simone, a Venezuelan left opposition activist. I would like to ask if the military has control of all the territory or if the armed groups of the oppressed nationalities control sectors of the territory and if this has been the case since the 1950s. Another question is on this united front that is in an armed resistance to the coup. What is Suu Kyi's party's role in it and if it has a program of respect to self-determination of oppressed nationalities? Finally, do you think the left should call for all support for this armed resistance? Thank you. Let you. Okay. Um <laughs> I was just in a webinar a few months ago with Venezuelans talking about um, the Burmese strategy of engaging UN bodies and doing that uh, right space international advocacy. Um, and I, I have, I think I have a friend who does um, Hearts for Venezuela. It's I think the only English, one of the few English social media accounts that focus on Venezuela. Anyway, solidarity. Um, uh, the military is not in control, which is why they've become incredibly brutal. They've lost control of the cities. Um, and that's why they are using rocket propelled grenades and, um, you know, um, setting up military bases in hospitals and universities, etc. because they are out of control. They just don't have control and uh, of, the, of the situation. Even their civil servants joined the civil disobedience movement and refused uh, to come back to work even when they evicted um, civil servants from their homes for failing to come to work. So they've had in Naypyidaw, the capital, there've been civil disobedience movement and um, the, they had to bring in the military uh, they had to bring park military trucks at the workers' quarters to prevent them from going to join the protests. And actually the first fatality was in Napido at a protest in Napido. So um, the military has become increasingly violent because it doesn't have control. Now, what we're seeing 
is the possibility of all the armed groups joining forces with the CRPH, which is mostly NLD members, member, member, um, members of parliament. Um, and these are second ranking, second ranking, second layer of, of leadership in the party, all the senior layer, the senior leadership is um, in detention. So it creates space for a new kind of leadership, a more collaborative and more responsive um, leadership. And this is where um, a coalition, a national unity government is much more possible. And, um, and it's a wake up call for the NLD that um, they, they cannot assume just because they have a majority that they have the right to do whatever they like. They now have to be much more accountable in how they make their decisions and they need to actually learn how to work in partnership with the ethnic, uh, with the ethnic nationalities. So um, this is also why um, the military has launched airstrikes in, uh, on civilian, communi civilian communities in Karen state for the first time in 20 years um, because uh, they are concerned that the NLD is teaming up with the Karen and the ethnics. So everyone's going to take a lot of hard hits if they continue to resist, but it looks like the ethnic groups understand that they have, they have to stand in unity and they have to win. They have to reverse the coup because if they don't, everyone is doomed. Debbie, who, who, where did the, um, the armed ethnic groups get their weapons from? Oh, some of the weapons are really old. <laughs> some of it's like, like from Vietnam War days, etc. Um, so it depends too. Um, you know, some of it's um, captured, some of it's bought from China, some of it's captured from um, engagements with um, um, with the with the army, the Tatmadaw. But there's a, a lot of old guns running around, um, and in some communities, the, some of the young people. Um, some of the young people already know how to rig up um, landmines using commercial batteries from the store. The good thing about those is that they kind of, they don't have a long life. Um, but, you know, people, people have their ways and means of getting their weapons. Some of those weapons, when they declared peace, were just hidden away, were buried away for times like this. And, and what about uh, Simone's last question, which was about uh, should the left just, call for yeah support? Okay, yeah, and that's not easy question, but still it's important. not an it's not an easy question. And I'll yeah. tell you why. Yeah. Um, I've always felt that I would not ask other people to do something that I wouldn't do myself, hmm. and I would not be in a position to carry weapons because they're heavy and they're very hot. Guns are very, get very hot when you fire them. But I understand that for a lot of people who are out in the streets, um, uh, they need to find a way to defend themselves. Uh, and it is pretty clear um, in the incidents in North Okalapa and other places, even when people surrendered or were clearly unarmed and running away, they were still shot. So it's pretty clear that um, it is not the time for us to say, please try to be nonviolent. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, what I can say is that I do not oppose armed resistance at this point. Mm -hmm. And what you want to do and what you want to call for is up to you. All right, I'm going to call on myself here and <clears throat> just say that um, 
you know, I, I check uh, a variety of news sources almost every day. And I'm really glad that I check Al Jazeera because if it weren't for their coverage of this, of this uprising and coup, I wouldn't even know about it. And I was immediately moved by this movement and just sort of stunned that it just was off the radar, although it's becoming more and more on the radar internationally, you know, obviously as each day passes and the, de the death toll grows. Um, you know, it is always, I, I don't know what the word is, but every, every revolutionary situation in civil war historically has so much in common. And when you sort of understand the, the moving parts, you, you see, I mean, as Michael talked about comparing it to the Arab Spring and some of the problems there. But um, so when I look at this situation and you described it, Debbie, as a civil war, of course, it's a civil war. And in a civil war, each side has its goals. And the question is, is who will win the civil war and what will they do once they've won? And, in, and we've, we've kind of covered this topic, you know, throughout the discussion about the unusual, not unusual, but that, I mean, the, 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 the fact that the military in, in Burma, should it be called Burma or Myanmar? I, is there, I mean, I don't know. I'm just going to say Burma for the time being. I, I'm not sure which is correct. Both but. are equally valid. I keep calling, I, I still call it Burma for a number of reasons. It's a long story, but anyway. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, the, yeah. The, the Burmese military, um, you know, is, is like a class unto itself. Um, I mean, I don't even know if we could call them the capitalist class properly in Burma with all of the international ties to corporations, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact that they, so it, it, it appears though, so you know, one, of the, one of the things that could happen is that, I mean, if there's not an actual, you know, an, <laughs> is that the, a deal will be made in the end, that there will be, you know, some section of the military, probably I'm guessing with uh, China behind the scenes, operating the strings will say, look, you have to cut a deal. And, you know, we can't look like the bad guys. China has been presenting itself as um, the benign force of economic development in the world for some time now. Like we're the good guys, the United States, bad guys, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, from what you said, I mean, that that's their out. What is their out in the situation? Their out is to make a deal with a section of the military that maybe is a little bit less malignant <laughs> And yeah. and then kind of deal with 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 um, the government of Mons the parliament the parliament the CRPH, but if that deal is cut, the same forces will be at play and nothing will really be resolved. Maybe some things will be resolved, but really nothing will be resolved in the end. We know that unless the military itself is under the control of the working class and the masses, the problem will continue. So th th that's one question. Um, that that seems like a likely likely outcome at this point. Um, so I guess uh, the one thing that I something I would like to know more about is um, I've taken a lot of notes here and I don't even know where this is. But you said that there was, I mean, the movement on the streets, the young people, the young women that are driving this movement, that are building their own handmade weapons, <laughs> have a series of demands and that they presented those to the CRPH. I would like to know what those demands are. Like, what is their vision of the society that they want to live in? Because, so, and they must yeah. just, you know, they must understand that who can, like, we don't want this military government anymore. We want a democracy, but we want these things. So those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you for your great presentation. Really appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. Um, the thing is that, you know, uh, in 20, 15 years ago, when it became possible to think about some type of transition, the military wanted a transition that didn't have Aung San Suu Kyi in it. And that's why in the 2010 election, they created the rules and uh, imposed rules that made it impossible for the NLD to run. But when Aung San Suu Kyi was released after the 2010 election, she ran in a 2012 by-election and her party won 
in a, you know, all those by-election seats. And it became pretty clear that they would probably win the 2015 election. So these are things to be aware of. But in that process, the movement was told there is no solution without the military. The military must be part of the solution. So go along with the provision that there's 25% unelected seats automatically awarded to the military in every legislature, not just national, but state as well. Go along with the fact that this 2008 constitution guarantees the military immunity from prosecution in civilian courts. Go along with the fact that the military has choice over who is Minister for Defense, Home Affairs, and Border Affairs. We have to compromise. This is politics. Go along with that because then they won't have a coup. And ironically, it was the Western countries that were also part of that process of pressure. So when human rights activists like us were saying, this is messed up, uh, 2008 constitution shouldn't actually be here, it needs to be changed, etc. No, but join the election anyway, that's the only game in town. Right? And then they were having orgasms over election and kind of conveniently forgot that this constitution is messed up in the first place and is actually going to be part of the problem. So, you know, it's, it's um, this time, the young people, including the young women said, abolish the 2008 constitution, don't amend it, just abolish it. We don't want any kind of accommodation with the military. This doesn't work. You know, this is an experiment that didn't work for us. We want to have a genuine democracy, a genuine federal system where all the states have respect, have power, have determined self-determination. So this is something which is quite a shift. It's quite exciting in that respect because nobody wants the, the movement does not want to compromise because they've had, they've got, they, they, they do not want to have to live with the threat of what a compromise could bring. Another coup, more compromises, more attacks on human rights, more attacks on liberties. So I think it's quite important to understand. So um, the NLD um, majority CRPH has already been told in no uncertain terms, and that's why they had to actually publicly announce their commitment to the abolition of the constitution and to the establishment of a genuine federal union. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't get the support from the civil disobedience movement and the general strike committees all around the country. So the question is now about holding them accountable to that. <clears throat> Okay, John, John, and um, John, I asked John to, uh, Simone asked another question, if you could include that in your, and then Frida just raised her hand. Okay, so okay. first of all, the, the question from Venezuela, um, the comrade asks, are you aware of any diplomatic or political links between the Chavista regime and the Myanmar military? We work at venezuelavoices.org which publishes independent and left opposition texts in English, meaning we don't support Guaido. So he's asking that. I'd like to make, uh, raise another uh, issue. And first of all, Cheryl mentioned something about, as I understand it, um, the Chinese government kind of moving to try to legitimize uh, the, the coup in some way to make it like a, a, a kinder, gentler coup in a way. 
in order to uh, facilitate investment and profit taking and, and so on. And you see, incidentally, that the same thing is happening in Syria. And it was just the other day that a representative of the Biden administration made a comment, which it seems to mean that the US is heading towards legitimizing Assad also. So we see where this kind of thing is headed. Now, the main thing I wanted to raise though is what Debbie mentioned about the land question and they've never been able to resolve that issue. And of course that's true throughout the entire underdeveloped or former colonial world. And as I understand it in several different countries, uh, in, for instance, in India, and I also know in a lot of other countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, where, but in India now they are moving towards breaking up like the system of small farmers. And I think where that's gonna lead is to the creation of agribusiness, of huge plantations. And uh, that would also involve um, further invasion of wild habitat. And this is another uh, arena in where we should be, the entire world should be very, very concerned because we are still living and it's not just if we're concerned about nature and so on it just from you know like a point of view of uh, human values or something but we're living in this uh, disastrous pandemic and what we've seen and i'm going to post a link on the chat and the chat to some articles that explain this further is what we're seeing is in this recent era is a huge acceleration of what they call zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that spread from other animals to humans. And the driving forces behind that are factory farming, including factory, factory agriculture and invasion of uh, wild habitat. And um, so what Debbie mentions about Myanmar, it sounds to me like the coup, one of the ultimate results of the coup, if it holds in power, will be further development of these forces, which will mean new and even more devastating uh, such, such diseases. And what we've seen is that, to put it quite bluntly, that capitalism in the underdeveloped world is unable to resolve the land question. And, or the only way that it does resolve it is through this uh, factory farming, factory uh, 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 agriculture, and so on. And it's the same with the national minorities, that they're unable to resolve that question. And we see where attempted compromise led under the Aung San Suu Kyi government, which tried to compromise with the military. And in fact, um, as far as I understand, it actually covered up for the military as far as their genocidal slaughter of, of the Rohingya. And where did it lead? It just actually ended up empowering the military and it led to this coup here. So it's the same with, if, with democratic rights, union rights, economic rights, that as we support the struggle for democratic rights throughout the world, that it seems to me that it has to be linked with the struggle to overthrow capitalism itself, which is the driving force behind all these disasters. Okay, Frida. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I This has been a fabulous discussion. And uh, I, uh, I agree that we really do need to learn from the lessons of the Arab Spring and especially Syria, and that there are definitely similarities to Syria in terms of the role of the army as a, um, as a caste. Uh, it seems to me that based on what I've heard from Debbie today, that the Myanmar struggle is way ahead in that they have women in the forefront challenging sexism, and they are facing the issue of ethnic uh, oppressed ethnic uh, 
minorities in the sense that they are, you're saying that one of the main demands of the opposition is a federal system, a democratic mm -hmm. federal system. And that to me is really interesting because even though, okay, it's not an, an anti-capitalist um, uh, system that they're asking for, at least explicitly, although it's a, they do have strong working class participation, the fact that they're even asking for a federal system is really important because um, in Syria, the Syrian Arab opposition was not willing to accept that. They were not willing to accept the federal system with the Kurds. Uh, mm -hmm. Kurdish uh, self-determination. And it, myself being from Iran, I know that the Iranian opposition, whether it's the liberal or social democratic or leftist, they would not talk at all about federalism. The moment you mention the word federalism, they say, oh, that's um, it's going to destroy the territorial integrity of our country. That's the expression they love, territorial integrity mm -hmm. of our country. So, if you're saying that the Myanmar opposition are willing to accept that, I, I, I'm quite impressed. That's very um, um, inspiring. That's all. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rita. Um, you just opened up three things I want to talk about. The, the first thing is there was a federal constitution drafting project about 20 years ago in which women took an active role and demanded a 30% quota in parliament. And actually we, should, we said that, you know, actually instead of have we just should just replace the 25% quota for the military with 25% quota for women parliamentarians and be done with it. But um, those discussions and those processes have taken place before. So it's, um, it's about it, it's not about reinventing the wheel, but renewing the wheel. So this is something that's quite important to understand. And the history of the country, the formation of the country, the Panglong Agreement of 1948 was actually about the different ethnic groups agreeing to form a union of Burma. So the name of the country was the Union of Burma. So now we're talking about uh, federal union, and in the uh, in the past twenty years, there were people going on study tours, looking at Malaysia, looking at the U.S., um, looking at other models, other federal models in, in Australia, even on how what a federal uh, system would look like. So there's been discussion of this, and that's why it it was nobody had to ask, what do you mean by a genuine federal union? Most people have, were aware of the discussions. The other thing too is uh, when we talked about the 25% focused on the future, the 25% that we've been using to focus on what are we going to do in the future includes work or uh, workshops, designing workshops to facilitate the development of economic, a feminist economic policy for Burma. The other part was actually a workshop to help people recognize, address, and build strategies um, to respond to the intersecting impacts of conflict, COVID-19, and climate change. Um, and the, the long-term impact of COVID-19 is actually the um, pressure for governments to engage in greater natural resource exploitation and mega projects that will harm the environment and harm and displace people in order to make up for gaps in the GDP. So this is, this is where we are focusing in, you know, dealing with the fire now in front of us, but we are also um, looking at what's next and starting the groundwork on those two key projects. Um, the building the capacity for um, 
a feminist economic policy for the country and um, recognizing building awareness and, strat and facilitating the development of strategies to address uh, conflict, COVID and climate change. And those two also intersect by themselves. So these are the, the things that we are talking about uh, in between dealing with what's going on in the country next door. All right, um, so I think we can wrap this up. We've covered a tremendous amount of territory. Um, and I really wanna thank everybody for their comments. Um, I, I have one last sort of just um, a uh, question very specific for you, Debbie, uh, very practical, which is John and I had talked about, and he mentioned it uh, earlier in the discussion about identifying some corporations here uh, that are connected and profiting from uh, the military junta there. And if we could find those and, you know, organize even a small picket line, of course, that, I mean, I would love to, we would love to see that across the country, maybe around the world. But if we do that, how could we get that information to this movement so that people, because I feel like they're they're alone. I mean, in, in any case, how could we express that solidarity? Send pictures, where do we, how do we get the word out about that? How do we Hash, do that? Hashtag what's happening in Myanmar, hashtag safe Myanmar, hashtag okay. milk tea alliance. Um, okay. Chevron, Chevron, uh, everyone's favorite American oil company. <laughs> has um, dealings in Burma and recently put out a, a very weird um, statement saying that they are not aware of and directly supporting the junta of how their investment directly supports the junta something around that line they're kind of like China they're trapped they're like ah! yeah <laughs> Yeah, they went and messed up Ecuador and now they want to mess up everybody else. So um, yes, there's a bunch of companies. Um, one of the easiest uh, places to go to is um, a website called Justice for Myanmar, which just looks at the business interests and economic links of the military. And then um, Burma Campaign UK has a dirty list of companies doing business in Burma. Incidentally, we're having a little bit of a fight with Cloudflare, the software company that's supposed to provide internet protection because they refuse to withdraw service from websites of the military. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so, well, great. Well, it's, yeah, great. All right, well, it's, Good to see everyone, and uh, I, I hope that we Thank see you, you again. Thank you for joining. Yeah, stay, yep. stay, take stay care. Safe. We greatly appreciate Debbie Stoddard for this presentation. She had to stay up late into the night because of the time difference to do so. And we owe it to her and to the movement to do what we can to help support our courageous sisters and brothers and comrades in Myanmar.